When Robert Baratheon defeated Rhaegar Targaryen at the Battle of the Trident, the rubies from Rhaegar's armor scattered across the ford, and it was forever after known as the Ruby Ford. This was the culmination of a successful rebellion waged in Westeros, the political climax of a long and bloody plot. But why do rebellions happen? What are the circumstances that breed them, and why do they succeed or fail? These are questions I'll try to answer today. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. I've previously spoken about the palace coup, which you can check out over there in the info card, but that is not the same as a rebellion. And a rebellion is not the same as a revolution. Someday when I'm feeling very brave and have a lot of time to shoot a video, I might do a video about revolutions. But today, I want to talk to you about rebellions. A rebellion is different from a coup in that it involves a large portion of the population rising up to replace the leadership of the government. They're not seeking to overturn the government, that's a revolution. They're seeking to replace the leader using history and fantasy alike. Let's take a look today at why rebellions happen how they play out, the importance that leadership plays, and what the fallout of rebellions can be. If you like this kind of world-building content, do consider smashing that subscribe button. And if you'd like to help me make more of these videos, buy my book, The Hidden Blade, or hit my Ko-fi page, and more about that at the end of the video. I also do have a Discord server where you can connect with me and other world builders. Okay, enough of that. Let's get cracking. So why do rebellions happen? Ted Gurr has got a very interesting model where he states that a rebellion is the result of value expectation mismatching with value capabilities. An example of this would be, let's say you shell out the money for a degree and you have the expectation that this will give you a better paying job. But because you are a first time college graduate, nobody else in your family has graduated from college, you don't have the network of influence that other families have if they are third or fourth generation college attendees. This leads to you not landing as good a job as those who have a long history of college graduation in their family. This leads to the unhappiness of value capability mismatching with value expectation. If enough people in a society experience this kind of mismatch, this will lead to the unhappiness that creates a rebellious society. And if you do want to read more about Ted Gurr's model, it is linked down below. Unhappiness alone doesn't lead to rebellion. It just leads to unhappiness. A society also needs to have a Goldilocks zone of oppression in order to create a rebellious situation. Rebellions don't flourish in open societies where you can replace your government. There is no need to rebel when you can affect the change that you want to see in society. Rebellions also don't flourish under a truly iron fist like North Korea. If the government's hand is clenched on the throat of the population, there is no way for them to rebel. So for a rebellion, you need a Goldilocks zone of oppression. Not so much that people can't do anything, but not so little that people can effectively change their government. Is that enough? Is that all you need? Unhappiness and a Goldilocks zone of oppression? No. Generally, a rebellion needs an initiating event. In the rebellion that I referenced in the opening scene, the rebellion was initiated by the Mad King burning Ned Stark's brother and father. This caused Ned Stark and Robert Baratheon and the other lords to rise up against them. For a historical example, the Polish Zeworowski rebellion kicked off when King Sigismund tried to force Parliament to approve a permanent standing army for Poland that would be financed and would answer to the king. At this time, the Polish monarchy was a constitutional monarchy that answered to the Polish parliament. Sigismund was trying to change it into an authoritarian model, and this kicked off the rebellion. 
That kind of initiating event is gold to a world builder and to somebody writing a story because it sets the tone for your rebellion. If you want people to be sympathetic to your rebellion, make the initiating event something terrible. If you want the government to be sympathetic, make the event something that the government was forced into doing, like they had to execute somebody because he broke all the laws. But the rebels use that event and propagandize it into starting the rebellion. Now, as I said, a rebellion requires the input of the people. It is not a coup where you have the military and the elite involved. This is the uprising of the people against the government. Therefore, your rebellion has to have enough popular support among the people to get them behind the rebellion. So there either needs to be propaganda getting them on board or the event needs to actually hit them where it hurts. And we will look at some more examples when we talk about leadership in rebellions. If you like this kind of exploration of root causes of politics, please do hit that thumbs up button. And let's move on to the role that leadership plays in rebellions. As I said, for a rebellion to work, you need people to be willing to lay down their lives for the rebellion. You need soldiers. This means you need hearts and minds. You need the common man to identify with and support at least part of the rebellion. Historically, we can see this most clearly with the English Peasant Rebellion in the 14th century, led by Wat Tyler. Just for some context, let's cover why this rebellion happened. The king, Richard II, wanted to levy a poll tax. A poll tax is a pretty harsh form of taxation where a uniform amount, no matter what you earn, is required to be paid by every person in the land. The crown needed this money in order to pay for the massive cost of the Hundred Years' War. This poll tax came on top of an attempt by the Statute of Labour which tried to fix the maximum price of labour. Yep, I said maximum price of labour. See, the Black Plague had so decimated Europe's population that peasants and labourers were in such short supply they could almost mint their own coins. So between the poll tax and the statute of labour, the crown was touching the peasants pretty hard in the wallet. And if you touch a person in the wallet, you are going to make them unhappy. So the peasants started rising up. But it's not enough to just have manpower. You need leadership. The peasants elected a man called Walter Tyler or Watt Tyler as their leader. Leaders such as Watt coming to the fore is often a core part of telling the story of the rebellion. We don't know much about Watt's story, but he successfully led the rebel army to capture Canterbury and the Savoy Palace belonging to John of Gaunt, the king's uncle. They finally marched into London and captured the tower itself. Of course, the government also has leaders, in this case the king, who insisted on going to speak with the rebels. He and Watt met, and Richard agreed to some concessions. But Watt was riding high on his success, and the next day he demanded more, including the confiscation of church lands. Fighting broke out in the course of the negotiations, and Watt was badly wounded. He was eventually taken by the king's men and beheaded, and the rebellion fell apart after that. So much for the history of the Peasant Rebellion. If you like hearing about historical examples to draw from in world building, give this video a thumbs up and let's check out a few fantasy rebel leaders. A good example of this kind of kill the leader and the rebellion dies can be seen in Glenn Cook's The Black Company, specifically the first book. If you have not yet read it, skip now to Fallout. In the Black Company, we're dumped in the middle of a story with our main protagonists as a group of mercenaries who are employed by the government who is suppressing a rebellion. And throughout the book, every time a rebel leader dies or is turned, the narrator makes a big deal out of it. And indeed, right at the end, the rebellion falls apart when the last leader dies. People milling around is just a mob. They can do damage, but they're not replacing a government. For that to happen, you need leadership. Another great example of this is how fast the Northern Rebellion collapses in A Song of Ice and Fire once Caitlin and Rob are dead. It went from King in the North to, oh, we're just loyal subjects of the crown, my lord, real fast after the Red Wedding. 
a fantasy example of good leadership taking a rebellion to a successful conclusion comes to us from Dune by Frank Herbert. You know the drill if you haven't read it, here come the spoilers. In Dune, Paul Atreides organizes the desert Fremen into a working army and leads them in an outright rebellion against the emperor's appointed stewards of the planet Arrakis. And because he is a good leader and keeps his rebels on track and he stays alive, the rebellion succeeds. Of course, failure or success both have great consequences in a rebellion-based plot. So, your ragtag bunch of rebels have succeeded against all the odds. Now, they have to rule. A good example of this comes to us from Game of Thrones, the very opening of the books. Robert Baratheon did win the battle at the Trident. He did kill Rhaegar Targaryen. And due to that, Robert Baratheon got to sit on the throne and be king. Those long years of being king clearly was not that good for him. He certainly wasn't good for the kingdom. He vastly overspent, and he misjudged the loyalty of the Lannisters by quite some distance. While he was a better king than the Mad King, I'd say that that's not a very high bar, and it's quite common for rebels to win the rebellion and then struggle in the ruling thereof, because it's easier to dethrone somebody than it is to rule well especially when you have just actively destabilized the kingdom by leading a rebellion. You have created a situation of lawlessness that must now be reigned in. And in that reigning in of the sense of lawlessness, good rebellion leaders often find themselves sucked into the same mistakes made by the previous regime and in time, there will be little to distinguish the rebel government that now exists from the previous government that they rebelled against. In theory, your rebels can successfully take over the government and all could be roses. But that's not a very interesting story to tell. So if that's the story you want to tell, tell the story of the rebellion and then cut scene to the roses and glory at the end. Failure, on the other hand can have fascinating consequences. Of course, it can end in the hangman's noose. But that does mean that the story is over at that point. There are other options. In the Polish rebellion that I referenced, the 60,000 rebels broke and ran when the army came for them. However, the rebellion was backing the power of parliament against the power of the king. So when the rebellion fallout happened, the Parliament gave the rebels immunity because the rebels had been fighting for their rights and the rebellion had so scared the king that he was forced into signing a declaration supporting the rights of Parliament. The rebellion failed, but it succeeded in its aims. So even in losing, the rebels really won. And that kind of dynamic can lead to a very interesting situation where you have victorious rebels, but you also have a victorious king. And that creates an enormous amount of conflict in your royal court. And conflict is what story is all about. Even what Tyler's rebellion actually succeeded, even though he didn't live to see it, the king was frightened by the rebellion and forced his government to abandon the poll tax. It is an interesting aspect of rebellions to explore that failure while at the same time succeeding element. Of course, depending on the story you want to tell, you might want to go with the rebellion fails completely and causes the iron fist of the government to fall upon the population and then telling the story of the population escaping from out under this iron fist, which is always a fun story to tell. So really, the fallout that you want from the rebellion is entirely dependent on what the story is that you want to tell after the rebellion. In order to have a rebellion, you need an unhappy population with a Goldilocks zone of oppression. You need good leadership and you need enough of the population to rise up to threaten the government. And finally, succeed or fail, a rebellion has fascinating consequences and a permanent impact on the culture of your world. And that is my take on rebellions as the climax of a political coup. 
What's your favorite rebellion in fantasy? Let me know in the comments below. I hope that you enjoyed that episode of Just In Time Worlds. Please do hit the thumbs up button if you did. It helps make sure that the algorithm doesn't bury the content out back. If you really enjoyed this and you want to help me make more of these videos, you can buy my book, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, or you can hit my Ko-fi page where you can make a one-off donation, buy a membership, or even buy a product.